Canada could be sitting on the biggest housing bubble of all time. That's according to one strategist who's warning that once it bursts, Canada could be thrown into a deeper recession. Do you know how many people live here? 12, 30. Will you be able to have your own house someday? <laughs> Never. Not possible at all. No, no, actually, no. I Grocery prices have increased at a really fast rate, the fastest rate in more than 40 years. What do you mean? Today, it's incredibly expensive to be a Canadian. With real estate, rent, and overall cost of living hitting new all time highs, Canadians are starting to reach a breaking point. In this video, I will walk you through the development of Canada's real estate crisis, explore how this is impacting Canadians, and draw parallels between Canada's current economic climate and Japan's pre-economic collapse to identify any similarities. How did Canada's real estate market get this bad? Canada's real estate crisis is complex, driven by high immigration and compounded by strict red tape that limits the construction of new homes. These factors collectively contribute to the escalating issue of unaffordable housing. But at the center of it all are the central banks, and in this case, the Bank of Canada. The Bank of Canada plays an important role in balancing between economic depression and hyperinflation. If the Bank of Canada lowers interest rates, they stimulate the economy by creating a favorable environment to borrow money. These loans are generally used to purchase homes, start businesses, and buy other assets, leading to increased demand and as a result, rising asset values. However, if interest rates remain low for an extended period without a relative rise in wages, a widening gap emerges between home affordability and average income. Now, if interest rates go up, the opposite happens. It creates an unfavorable environment to take on loans. It becomes harder to afford mortgages and sometimes forces people to sell their homes due to increased monthly payments. If high interest rates are maintained for too long, it can lead to a significant downturn in the housing market and even contribute to a broader economic recession. For example, if fewer people are buying homes because of high borrowing costs, construction companies might cut back on new projects leading to job losses in the construction sector. Retail businesses related to home furnishing and home improvements might also see reduced sales. In a worst case scenario, the banking sector could experience an uptick in loan defaults, putting financial institutions at risk. This is a careful balancing act. Raising interest rates can create a ripple effect that is felt throughout our economy and is not sustainable long term. In 2023, we are now in the high interest cycle due to aggressive monetary policies that were implemented to stimulate the economy during the COVID-19 lockdown. During the peak of COVID-19, Canada faced the decision to let the economy fall due to the lockdowns imposed or save the economy by lowering interest rates and implementing quantitative easing. Canadians were given over $240 billion through CERB and other business programs. When a central bank prints more money, there's an increase in the amount of money circulating in the economy. However, the total number of assets such as houses, land, or stocks remains constant. Think of it like an auction. If everyone at the auction suddenly has twice as much money to spend, but the number of items being auctioned stays the same, the prices of those items are likely to go up because people have more money to bid with. And that's exactly what happened to the real estate market. Within just two years, the average house price in Ontario rose almost 50%. And in some areas in Canada, that number is higher. The Bank of Canada recognized that keeping interest rates low after they printed so much money not only fuels the demand for real estate, but also causes high inflation. Why does the Bank of Canada care about high inflation? When a country's dollar inflates, it's like a product's price going up without any improvement in quality. Suddenly, that product, or in this case, the currency, becomes less attractive. People in other countries may think twice before holding on to it. This hesitation can slowly chip away at a country's influence in global trade. As fewer and fewer opt for that currency, the country's position on the global stage starts to wobble, potentially causing the economy to stumble and spiral. Canada's inflation 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 inflation, inflation. inflation. spiked up to 4% in August. That's how many Canadians will go bankrupt and will we have a mortgage crisis? With rising inflation, the Bank of Canada needed to pivot. In March 2022, the Bank of Canada initiated its first of 10 consecutive interest rate hikes. By July 2023, Canada's key interest rate had climbed to 5%. 
To put that into perspective, before the start of COVID, it stood at just 1.75%. This directly impacts Canadians who hold mortgages, especially those with variable rate mortgages as impacts are more instant. To put it in perspective, an individual with a $1 million variable rate mortgage would pay an additional $1,000 each month for every percent the interest rate goes up. Those who secured a variable rate mortgage at a key interest rate of 1.75% will have had their mortgage payments go up a minimum of $3,250 a month. Those who opted for a 5-year fixed rate mortgage will soon face renewals at these high interest rates. But don't forget, these rates are based on a best case scenario and it does not reflect what the banks are offering to consumers today. For example, before the Bank of Canada began raising interest rates, RBC's posted rate on variable mortgages was around 2.5%. Today, it exceeds 7%. And with the example we used earlier, that's an increase of almost $5,000 a month for that million dollar mortgage. This puts immense pressure on Canadian families who are living paycheck to paycheck, and the data reflects this. Recent data Data from TD Bank paints a worrying picture. As of July 2023, 48% of its Canadian mortgages had an amortization period exceeding the standard 25 years. This sharp rise, up from 35% the year before, indicates an urgent effort by Canadians to deal with financial pressures, pushing them to extend their loans beyond 35 years. If that's not bad enough, TD's head of Canadian personal banking noted in a conference call that they have been proactively reaching out to borrowers who have hit what they refer to as a trigger rate. This is the point at which the payments on a variable rate mortgage no longer covers the interest. This means that some Canadians are dedicating their entire mortgage payment to interest without making a dent in the principal amount, and even doing that is not enough to cover the interest on the loan. What should Canadians do? Sell their homes? Where would they live? Renting would be the obvious choice, but it's not that simple. At $1,000 a month, this room... It's $1,600 two floors. 1600 bucks. Is slightly above the average salary in Canada and Canadians are running out of options. It's like talking to a brick wall with these people. Canadians are at their limits. Rent costs has been hitting all-time highs in Canada. Rental vacancy rates across Canada dropped from 3.1% in 2019 to 1.4% in 2023, representing a 54.84% decrease. But what's behind these numbers? A fierce competition for a place to call home. Desperate renters find themselves in bidding wars, often paying above the ask price only to find themselves in less than ideal living conditions. Do you know how many people live here? Right now, like, 12, 30, 30? 13. Yeah, right now it's 6 right here, um, 7 bunch. 6 here, 7 downstairs. Yeah. It's a lot. This is it? cheap. Into the city's rental crisis. This is my unit. Oh, wow. This is the place he calls home. It's a lot different than what the hallway looks like, isn't it? This is, that's crazy. From the crumbling bathroom to mold and water damage. Having to live like this, my depression got to a point where they hospitalized me twice. Spaces are cramped, often in less ideal places, as landlords scramble to cash in. Some Canadians, overwhelmed by the crisis, have reached a breaking point. It's clear that many Canadians are under a lot of stress, but because of high inflation, we might be in this high interest cycle for longer than we anticipate. What happens to economies if interest rates are too high for too long? To better understand the potential path Canada might be on, let's examine Japan's economic bubble that destroyed their economy. By analyzing parallels between the two, we can foresee the possible trajectory of Canada's economy if stretched too thin. Just like Canada's current real estate market, the Japanese asset bubble was driven by factors such as low interest rates, speculative behavior, and lenient regulations. In the 1980s, Japan found itself in a situation not too different from Canada's today. Property and asset prices were soaring. A significant catalyst that caused this was the Plaza Accord in 1985. This agreement, involving major countries, aimed to correct trade imbalances, especially favoring the U.S. by devaluing the U.S. dollar against other currencies, including the Japanese yen. The result, the yen got stronger. 
A stronger yen might sound good on paper, but for Japan, a country heavily relying on exports, it was a problem. Their goods became more expensive overseas, hurting their export-driven economy. Reacting to this challenge, the Bank of Japan made a move Canadians might find familiar. They cut interest rates, hoping to boost spending within Japan and offset the export losses. Low interest rates made borrowing cheap, and just as we've seen in Canada recently, people and businesses borrowed heavily, especially to invest in real estate. As more people chased after properties, prices shot up. The peak of this frenzy saw Japanese real estate, particularly in urban areas, priced at levels that made little economic sense. At the bubble's peak, Japan's land value was four times that of the entire United States, a country 25 times larger in size. However, just like any bubble, it was bound to burst. Realizing that property prices had spiraled out of control and were far from sustainable, the Bank of Japan did what the Bank of Canada is doing now. They started raising interest rates. The goal was to cool down the overheated market. However, higher interest rates made borrowing expensive. As loans got pricier, the demand for property began to drop and so did the prices. This downward spiral was worsened by a slowing global economy which hurt Japan's exports even more. In 1991, the inevitable happened. Japan's economic bubble burst, leading to an economic downturn that lasted for years, known as the Lost Decades. The impacts were wide-reaching, businesses went under, unemployment soared, and many people faced hardships like homelessness. The similarities between Canada and Japan are striking. Japan's economic bubble paints a real picture of the possible outcome that can happen to Canada's economy. And if history repeats, this is just the beginning and it will get a whole lot worse for Canadians before it can get any better. It's hard to predict what exactly will happen to Canada's economy, but I'll leave you with this. A junior chicken from McDonald's now costs $3.89. Can we please bring back the $1.39 menu? Please.